The legacy of Subhas Chandra Bose, quotes, ideology, and impact. Subhas Chandra Bose, January 23, 1897 to August 18, 1945, was a prominent Indian nationalist known for his defiance of British authority during the era of the British Raj. He earned the honorific title of Nataji, meaning respected leader, which is still widely used in India today. Born into an affluent Bengali family in Orissa, Bose received a Western education and was sent to England to take the Indian Civil Service examination. Although he excelled in the initial exam, he chose not to proceed with the final one, citing his commitment to Indian nationalism as a higher calling. Upon his return to India in 1921, Bose joined the nationalist movement, aligned with Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian National Congress. Over time, he emerged as a leader within a faction of the Congress that leaned more towards socialism and less towards constitutional reform, following the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru. Bose became the president of the Indian National Congress in 1938, and after his re-election in 1939, differences arose with other Congress leaders, including Mahatma Gandhi, over various issues, including the future of British India and princely states. Furthermore, his approach to nonviolence and his aspirations for greater authority raised concerns within the Congress leadership. A significant number of Congress working committee members resigned in protest, leading to Bose's resignation as president and his eventual expulsion from the party. In April 1941, Bose arrived in Nazi Germany, where the leadership offered limited support for India's independence. German funds were used to establish a Free India Center in Berlin and a Free India Legion consisting of Indian prisoners of war captured by Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps, was formed to serve under Bose's leadership. Despite considering a land invasion of India, the German army was preoccupied with the Eastern Front by 1942, prompting Bose to seek support in Southeast Asia, where Japan had recently achieved swift victories. In May 1942, Adolf Hitler offered to arrange a submarine for Bose. During this period, Bose became a father, as his wife or companion, Emily Schenkel, gave birth to a baby girl. Identifying strongly with the Axis powers, Bose boarded a German submarine in February 1943. He was later transferred to a Japanese submarine and disembarked in Japanese-held Sumatra in May 1943. With Japanese support, Bose restructured the Indian National Army, INA, comprising Indian prisoners of war captured by the Japanese during the Battle of Singapore. A provisional government of Free India was established in the Japanese-occupied Andaman and Nicobar Islands, nominally presided over by Bose. While Bose was charismatic and driven, the Japanese considered him to lack military expertise, and the INA's efforts were short-lived. In late 1944 and early 1945, the British Indian Army reversed the Japanese attack on India, resulting in substantial casualties among the Japanese and INA forces. The remaining INA troops were forced to retreat down the Malay Peninsula, eventually surrendering upon the recapture of Singapore. Bose chose to flee to Manchuria, seeking a future in the Soviet Union, which he believed had turned against British colonialism. Tragically, he perished from third-degree burns sustained when his overloaded plane crashed in Japanese Taiwan on August 18, 1945. Some Indians were unwilling to accept his death, holding out hope for his return to secure India's independence. While the Indian National Congress praised Bose's patriotism, they distanced themselves from his tactics and ideology. Subhas Chandra Bose's legacy is complex. In India, he is celebrated as a hero, with his story serving as an inspiration for the nation's struggle for independence. However, his associations with Japanese fascism and Nazism raise significant ethical questions, especially his reluctance to publicly condemn the worst atrocities of German anti-Semitism or offer refuge in India to its victims. His legacy reflects the multifaceted nature of his contributions to Indian nationalism, including both heroic actions and controversial alliances. Subhas Chandra Bose was born to Prabhavati Bose, Nadut, and Jankinath Bose on January 23, 1897 in Katak, a part of what is now the state of Odisha in India. At the time, it was known as the Orissa Division of Bengal Province under British colonial rule. Prabhavati, affectionately called Majanani, meaning mother, was the anchor of the family and had her first child at the age of 14, eventually having 13 children. Subhas was the ninth child and the sixth son. Jankinath, a successful lawyer and government pleader, was loyal to the British colonial government and meticulous about matters related to language and the law. Despite his success and urban lifestyle, 
he maintained a connection to his rural roots, visiting his village annually during the Puja holidays. Subhas joined the Baptist Mission's Protestant European School in Katak in January 1902, eager to be with his five older school-going brothers. The school primarily used English as the medium of instruction and catered to a student population composed of Europeans or Anglo-Indians of mixed British and Indian ancestry. The curriculum focused on teaching proper English, Latin, the Bible, British geography, British history, and good manners. Indian languages were not part of the curriculum. Sabaza's father had chosen the school, with the intention of ensuring that his sons learned to speak impeccable English and adopt the correct intonation. This was believed to be important for interacting with the British in India. At home, only Bengali was spoken, and his mother, who worshipped Hindu goddesses and shared stories from the Mahabharata and Ramayana, instilled in Sabaz a nurturing spirit and a desire to help people in distress. Sabaz preferred gardening to playing sports with other boys. His father, who was reserved and preoccupied with his professional life, played a more distant role in the large family, leaving Sabaz with a sense of having had an unremarkable childhood. Despite this, Jankinath was an avid reader of English literature, and Sabaz and several of his siblings developed a deep appreciation for English literature, including works by John Milton, William Cooper, Matthew Arnold, and Shakespeare's Hamlet. In 1909, at the age of 12, Sabaz joined the Ravenshaw Collegiate School in Katak, following in the footsteps of his five brothers. Here, he learned Bengali and Sanskrit and was exposed to ideas from Hindu scriptures, such as the Vedas and the Upanishads, which were not typically discussed at home. Subhaza's Western education continued, but he also started to wear Indian clothing and engage in religious contemplation. He corresponded with his mother about the teachings of the Bengali mystic Ramankrishna Paramahansa, the writings of Swami Vivekananda, and the novel Ananda Math by Binkim Chandra Chatterjee, which were popular among young Hindu men at the time. He demonstrated the ability to focus on his studies when necessary and succeeded in his exams. In 1912, he secured the second position in the matriculation examination held by the University of Calcutta. Subhas followed his five brothers once more in 1913, enrolling at Presidency College, Calcutta, the prestigious institution for upper caste Hindu men. He chose to study philosophy, delving into the works of Western philosophers like Kant, Hegel, Bergson, and others. During this time, he developed a strong friendship with Hemant Akumar Sarkar, which evolved into a deep emotional connection. Their relationship was characterized by religious yearnings, and in the language of spiritual devotion, they professed their love for each other. In the vacations of 1914, they embarked on a journey across northern India in search of a spiritual guru to guide them. However, Sabaz contracted typhoid fever during the trip, which led his family to believe he had run away since they were not clearly informed about his journey. Sabaz's return created emotional distress for his parents, and it took the presence of his favorite brother, Sharat Chandra Bose, who had returned from studying law in England, to calm the situation. Sabaz returned to Presidency College, where he excelled in his studies, participated in debates, and engaged in student journalism. In February 1916, Sabaz was alleged to have been involved in an incident with E. F. Oten, a professor of history at Presidency College. It was claimed that Oten had made disrespectful remarks about Indian culture and had confronted and pushed some students. The incident led to students accosting Oten, beating him with sandals, and fleeing. Sabaz was among those who fled, even though Oten remained unharmed and could not identify his attackers. A college servant claimed to have seen Sabaz among those who fled, which confirmed the rumors among students. Sabaz was expelled from the college and rusticated from the University of Calcutta. The incident shocked Calcutta and caused anguish for Subhas's family. His family used their connections to exert pressure on a Sutash Mukherjee, the vice-chancellor of Calcutta University. Despite the efforts, Subhas's expulsion remained in effect until July 20, 1917, when the syndicate of Calcutta University allowed him to return but to a different college. He joined Scottish Church College, where he completed his B.A. in philosophy with honors in 1918, ranking second among all philosophy students in Calcutta University. At the insistence of his father, Subhas decided to travel to England to prepare for and appear for the Indian Civil Services, ICS, examination. He arrived in London in October 1919 and submitted his application for the ICS. He also aspired to gain admission to a college at the University of Cambridge, even though he had missed the admission deadline. With the help of fellow Indian students and the non-collegiate students' board, 
he managed to gain entry to the university and began preparing for the ICS exams. He entered the register of the university in November 1919. Six vacancies were available for the ICS, and Sabaz secured the fourth position in the open competitive exam held in August 1920. This marked a crucial step toward becoming an ICS officer, but he still needed to pass the final examination in 1921, which covered various topics related to India, including the Indian Penal Code, the Indian Evidence Act, Indian history, and proficiency in an Indian language. Successful candidates were also required to pass a writing test. As the final examination approached, Subhas started to have doubts about pursuing a career in the ICS. He corresponded extensively with his family, especially his father and his brother Sharat Chandra Bose, who were in Calcutta. In a letter to Sharat, Subhas expressed his reservations about following the conventional path. He mentioned that he had been inclined to ideas that could be considered unconventional and that the line of least resistance wasn't suitable for someone like him. The uncertainties of life did not trouble him, as he did not harbor worldly ambitions and wanted to serve his country to the fullest, unburdened by the civil service. In April 1921, Subhas made the firm decision not to take the final ICS examination. He wrote to Sharat, apologizing for the pain he would cause to his family. On April 22, 1921, he wrote to the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montagu, expressing his wish to have his name removed from the list of ICS probationers. Subhas's mother wrote a letter in support of his decision, stating her preference for the ideals represented by Mahatma Gandhi, which relieved Subhas. He passed his Cambridge BA final examinations with a third-class result, and, with his decision to leave the ICS behind, he prepared to return to India in June 1921. Subhas decided not to collect his diploma personally, asking a fellow Indian student to do so on his behalf. Ultimately, Subhas's journey took a different path, as he became deeply involved in the struggle for India's independence. His decision to relinquish a potential career in the ICS and his strong connections with political leaders in Bengal, such as C. R. Das, played a significant role in shaping his future. Subhas Bose's life, marked by intellectual curiosity, a search for spiritual enlightenment, and a commitment to India's freedom, became closely intertwined with the larger historical events of his time. From 1921 to 1932, Subhas Chandra Bose's life was intricately intertwined with the Indian National Congress and the broader struggle for India's independence. In July 1921, at the age of 24, Subhas Bose returned to India, landing in Bombay. His first order of business was to secure an interview with Mahatma Gandhi, who was leading the non-cooperation movement. The meeting took place in Bombay, and in Bose's recollection of the encounter, he posed numerous questions to Gandhi. However, he found Gandhi's responses vague, his objectives unclear, and his plan for achieving independence lacking in detail. The fundamental differences between the two leaders became apparent in this initial meeting. Gandhi was an unwavering advocate of nonviolence, believing it to be the only morally acceptable means to achieve their goals, whereas Bose was more flexible in his approach, willing to consider a broader range of means to end British colonial rule. Additionally, Bose was inclined toward certain aspects of totalitarian governance, a viewpoint Gandhi vehemently rejected. Gandhi, recognizing these differences, directed Bose toward C. R. Das, a prominent leader of Congress and Indian nationalism in Bengal. Bose found in Das a leader who was more amenable to his ideas and aspirations. Das encouraged Bose's involvement in nationalist politics, marking the beginning of Bose's journey within the framework of the Indian National Congress. In 1922, Bose established the newspaper Swaraj and took on the responsibility of publicity for the Bengal Provincial Congress Committee. His mentor during this period was Chittaranjan Das, a leading proponent of aggressive nationalism in Bengal. In 1923, Bose was elected president of the Indian Youth Congress and also took on the role of secretary for the Bengal State Congress. He became the editor of the newspaper Forward, which had been founded by Chittaranjan Das. Additionally, Bose served as the CEO of the Calcutta Municipal Corporation when Das was elected mayor of Calcutta in 1924. During a protest march in Calcutta that same year, Bose, along with other leaders like Magfura Mata Jazi, was arrested and imprisoned. In 1927, following his release from prison, Bose assumed the position of General Secretary of the Congress Party and collaborated with Jawaharlal Nehru on the path toward India's independence. In late December 1928, Bose organized the annual meeting of the Indian National Congress in Calcutta, 
marking a significant event in his political career. During this period, Bowes also played a notable role as the general officer commanding, GOC, of the Congress Volunteer Corps, a volunteer organization in uniform. This role, complete with British-style uniforms and steel-cut epaulets, drew some controversy, particularly from Mahatma Gandhi, who was a committed pacifist and staunchly opposed military-style displays. Gandhi's concerns led him to describe the Congress session as a Bertram Mill circus, provoking indignation among the Bengali population. Subsequently, Bose faced imprisonment again for civil disobedience, but upon his release, he took on the role of mayor of Calcutta in 1930. This period was marked by Bose's active participation in the Indian National Congress and his deep involvement in the fight for India's freedom. Between 1933 and 1937, Subhas Chandra Bose experienced a series of significant events and undertook various activities. 1933 to 1935. During this period, Bose traveled throughout Europe, where he visited Indian students and interacted with European politicians, even meeting with Benito Mussolini. These experiences allowed him to gain insights into party organization and observe the workings of communism and fascism. He used this time to conduct research and write the first part of his book, The Indian Struggle, which covered the Indian independence movement from 1920 to 1934. The book was published in London in 1935, but the British government banned it in India due to concerns that it might incite unrest. In Europe, Bose received support from the Indian Central European Society, which was organized by Otto Faltus in Vienna, 1937-1940. In 1938, Subhas Chandra Bose expressed his opinion that the Indian National Congress, Inc., should be organized as a broad anti-imperialist front with the dual objectives of achieving political freedom and establishing a socialist regime. He accepted the nomination as the Congress president and believed in the complete self-governance of India, including the use of force if necessary. However, this stance created a rift with Mahatma Gandhi, who opposed Bose's presidency. Despite the differences and the resultant division within the Indian National Congress, Bose aimed to maintain unity within the party. Gandhi advised Bose to form his own cabinet. This division also created strains between Bose and Jawaharlal Nehru, with Bose appearing at the 1939 Congress meeting on a stretcher. Bose was elected as Congress president again, which led to Gandhi's preferred candidate, Puttubi Sitaramaya, being defeated. Tevar provided strong support for Bose during the inter-Congress dispute. However, the Congress Working Committee's maneuvers eventually forced Bose to resign from the presidency. On June 22, 1939, Bose organized the All India Forward Bloc, a faction within the Indian National Congress aimed at consolidating the political left. Its main stronghold was in Bengal. Umuthar Malingam Tevar, a staunch supporter of Bose, joined the forward bloc and organized a massive rally during Bose's visit to Madurai. During this time, Bose's political ideology evolved, and he came to believe that an independent India would need a period of socialist authoritarianism, inspired by figures like Kemal Ataturk in Turkey. Despite his efforts, the British authorities refused him permission to meet with Ataturk. Bose tried to engage with British Labour Party leaders and political thinkers in England, but the Conservative Party officials declined to meet with him. At the outbreak of World War II, Bose advocated mass civil disobedience to protest against the decision of Viceroy Lord Linlithgow to involve India in the war without consulting Congress leadership. This campaign included protests in Calcutta, where he called for the removal of the Holwell Monument. Bose was arrested but later released following a hunger strike. His activities were closely monitored by British authorities. These years were marked by Bose's relentless pursuit of India's independence and his evolving political strategies, leading to his emergence as a prominent leader in the Indian National Congress and the broader struggle for freedom. In 1941, Subhas Chandra Bose embarked on a daring escape to Nazi Germany from British-controlled India. Here's a breakdown of his escape and journey. Arrest and Release Bose's arrest and subsequent release by British authorities set the stage for his escape. To prepare for his escape, he grew a beard and sought solitude to avoid British guards. On the night of January 17, 1941, Bose dressed as a paton, wearing brown long coats, a black fez-style cap, and broad pajamas to avoid being recognized. He escaped from his home in Calcutta and, along with his nephew Sisir Kumar Bose, reached Goma Railway Station in the state of Bihar, India, now Jharkhand. Journey to Peshawar from Gomo Railway Station, he traveled to Peshawar with the assistance of the Abwehr, a German military intelligence organization. 
In Peshawar, he was received by Akbar Shah, Muhammad Shah, and Bhagat Ram Talwar, who provided him with support. Both stayed at the home of Abad Khan, a trusted friend of Akbar Shah. Beginning of the journey to Russia. On January 26, 1941, Bose commenced his journey to reach the Soviet Union through the northwest frontier province, which shared a border with Afghanistan. To avoid detection, Mian Akbar Shah, a forward bloc leader in the northwest frontier province, suggested a unique disguise for Bose. Since he couldn't speak Pashto, Shah advised him to act deaf and dumb and let his beard grow to resemble that of the local tribesmen. Support in Afghanistan with the assistance of the supporters of the Aga Khan III, Bose was smuggled across the border into Afghanistan. He was met by an Abwehr unit posing as a group of road construction engineers from the organization Tote, who helped him cross Afghanistan through Kabul to the border with the Soviet Union. Assuming multiple identities. To reach the Soviet Union, Bose changed his guise multiple times. He initially pretended to be a Pashtun insurance agent. After entering Afghanistan, he assumed a new identity with the help of an Italian passport belonging to Count Orlando Mazada, an Italian nobleman. Arrival in Nazi Germany After a series of journeys and changing identities, Bose reached the Soviet Union, hoping for support due to its historical enmity with British rule in India. However, he was disappointed by the Soviet response. He was then transported to Moscow, where he met with the German ambassador, Count von der Schulenburg. In Moscow, he was passed over to the German authorities and flown to Berlin in a special courier aircraft in April. In Berlin, he received a more favorable hearing from Joachim von Ribbentrop and officials at the Wilhelmstrasse, the foreign ministry. Subhas Chandra Bose's escape and journey were marked by ingenuity and a series of disguises and support networks that eventually led him to Nazi Germany, where he hoped to seek assistance for India's independence struggle. During his time in Germany from 1941 to 1943, Subhas Chandra Bose engaged in various activities and collaborations with Nazi Germany. Here's a summary of his actions during this period. 1. Special Bureau for India In Germany, Bose was attached to the Special Bureau for India under Adam von Trotzu Souls. This bureau was responsible for broadcasting on the German-sponsored Azad Hind radio. Bose founded the Free India Center in Berlin, which served as a platform for his activities. 2. Indian Legion Bose created the Indian Legion, comprising around 4,500 Indian prisoners of war who had previously fought for the British in North Africa before being captured by Axis forces. The Indian Legion was attached to the Wehrmacht, and later, it was transferred to the Waffen-SS. Members of the Indian Legion swore allegiance to both Adolf Hitler and Subhas Chandra Bose. 3. Residence and Personal Life Bose was provided with a luxurious residence by the German Foreign Office. He had staff including a butler, cook, gardener, and an SS chauffeured car. He lived openly with Emily Schenkel, and they had a daughter in November 1942. Despite their relationship, some members of the Special Bureau for India did not get along with Emily and questioned the nature of her association with Bose. 4. Quest for Support Bose sought support from Nazi Germany but faced disappointment when the Germans were reluctant to form an alliance with him. Many Germans considered Bose less popular than leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. During a meeting with Adolf Hitler in May 1942, Bose requested assistance and official recognition, but Hitler did not fulfill his requests. Instead, Hitler facilitated Bose's voyage to Southeast Asia via a submarine in February 1943. 5. Departure for Southeast Asia By early 1943, Bose became keen on moving to Southeast Asia due to Japan's recent victories there. He left Emily Schenkel and their daughter and embarked on a German submarine to travel to Japanese-occupied Southeast Asia. Approximately 3,000 Indian prisoners of war joined the Free India Legion, but Bose's departure left these men leaderless and demoralized in Germany. Bose's experiences in Germany and his collaboration with Nazi authorities were marked by his efforts to gain support for India's independence from British colonial rule. However, he ultimately became disillusioned with the Nazis and sought new avenues to further his cause in Southeast Asia. 1943-1945 Journey to Japan Subhas Chandra Bose's journey from Germany to Japan was fraught with danger. After leaving Nazi Germany, he boarded a German submarine, U-180 and sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. The journey was arduous, and at times, they had to remain submerged to avoid detection. 
The transfer from U-180 to the Japanese submarine I-29 was an extraordinary feat, marking the only civilian transfer between two different submarines of different navies during World War II. This journey demonstrated Bose's unwavering commitment to seeking support for India's independence. Revival of the Indian National Army, INA Upon reaching Japan, Bose took charge of the Indian National Army, INA, an entity that had been established earlier but disbanded due to differences with its previous leader, Captain Mohan Singh. Under Bose's leadership, the INA was reorganized and rejuvenated. Major Awechi Fujiwara played a crucial role in the formation of the INA. His mission was to create an army that would fight alongside the Japanese forces for India's independence. This marked the beginning of the renewed INA's operations. Support for Azad Hind Movement Bose's leadership inspired the Indian expatriate population in Southeast Asia to support the Azad Hind Movement. This support took various forms, including both enlistment in the INA and financial contributions to the cause. Under Bose's leadership, the Azad Hind government created its own currency, postage stamps, a court system, and civil code. The government's recognition by nine Axis states demonstrated the international scope of the movement. Military Operations The INA participated in various military operations in conjunction with the Japanese army. This included engagements along the eastern Indian frontiers, such as Manipur. INA specialized units, such as the Bahadur Group, carried out covert operations behind enemy lines, supporting diversionary attacks in Arakan and the Japanese offensive toward Impal and Kohima. Challenges in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands The Japanese occupation of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in 1942 marked a significant development in the Azad Hind movement's efforts. However, the Japanese administration in the islands had its share of problems. During Bose's visit to the islands, he was isolated from the local population, raising questions about his awareness of the administration's actions. This isolation prevented him from addressing issues like the torture of Diwan Singh, a local leader, by the Japanese authorities. Battles on the Indian mainland In the town of Moarang, Manipur, the Indian tricolor flag was raised for the first time, marking a symbolic moment in the struggle for India's independence. Battles in Kohima and Impal involved a protracted siege by Japanese and INA forces. These battles were part of Operation Yugo, which aimed to conquer the Indian mainland but ultimately proved unsuccessful. Impact of Battles The battles in Kohima and Impal were significant engagements, and the subsequent counterattack by Commonwealth forces led to a retreat of Axis-led forces back into Burmese territory. While the INA continued to participate in other battles in Burmese territory, the Japanese surrender and the fall of Rangoon marked the end of its effective presence as a political entity. Following World War II, INA prisoners faced repatriation to India, with some individuals put on trial for treason. This period in Bose's life was marked by intricate military operations, political activities, and complex relationships between the INA, the Japanese authorities, and other Axis powers. Despite challenges and setbacks, Bose's determination to fight for India's independence remained undiminished. Subhas Chandra Bose's death on August 18, 1945, marked a tragic and controversial chapter in his life. Here is a more detailed account of the circumstances surrounding his death. Plane crash in Formosa, Taiwan. Subhas Chandra Bose's fatal journey occurred when he was attempting to leave Japanese-occupied Formosa, now Taiwan. He boarded a Japanese plane that was overloaded and bound for a destination that would ultimately remain uncompleted. The tragic crash. As the plane was departing from Taihoku, now Taipei, at around 2.30 p.m., an engine failure occurred, leading to a loud sound similar to an engine backfire. The portside engine and its propeller fell out of the plane, causing it to swing wildly and crash. The plane broke into two parts and exploded into flames. Casualties and Injuries the crash resulted in casualties, including the instant deaths of the chief pilot, co-pilot, and Lieutenant General Tsunamesa Shurde. Shurde was supposed to negotiate with the Soviet army in Manchuria on Bose's behalf. Bose and his assistant, Hababur Rahman, survived the crash but were injured. Bose's clothes were soaked in gasoline, and he was badly burned, especially on his chest and face. Immediate medical attention. The ground staff at the airport saw Bose and Rahman, both injured, approaching. They had to smother the flames on Bose's body. A truck used as an ambulance rushed them to the Nanmon Military Hospital south of Taihoku. Medical Treatment 
Dr. Teniyoshi Yoshimi, the surgeon in charge at the hospital, saw evidence of third-degree burns on Bose's body, especially on his chest. Dr. Yoshimi immediately started treatment, applying a disinfectant called Rivamol, a white ointment, and bandaging Bose's injuries. He also administered injections and intravenous fluids to address his weakened condition. Coma and death. Despite the medical treatment, Bose went into a coma, a few hours after the crash, between 9 and 10 p.m. on August 18, 1945. Sadly, Bose passed away at the age of 48, marking the end of a remarkable and tumultuous journey in the struggle for India's independence. Cremation and Memorial Subhas Chandra Bose's body was cremated in the main Taihoka crematorium two days after his death, on August 20, 1945. His ashes were later transferred to Tokyo, where a memorial service was held for Bose on September 14, 1945. The ashes were placed in the care of the Renkoji Temple of Nichiren Buddhism in Tokyo, where they have remained ever since. Reactions and Controversies The news of Bose's death had a significant impact, with widespread disbelief and shock among the members of the Indian National Army, INA, and its supporters. In India, the Indian National Congress expressed a mix of emotions, with Mahatma Gandhi acknowledging Bose as a patriot but also referring to him as misguided. Opinions about Bose and the INA varied among the Indian soldiers in the British Indian Army, and the British Raj tried INA officers for treason but later reconsidered their actions. Subhas Chandra Bose's death left a lasting legacy, with many questions, conspiracy theories, and myths continuing to surround the circumstances of his passing, especially among his devoted supporters, particularly in Bengal. Subhas Chandra Bose's ideology was a complex blend of spirituality, nationalism, and a unique political vision. Here's a detailed exploration of his ideological beliefs. Inspirations Bhagavad Gita, Bose found inspiration for the struggle against British colonialism in the Bhagavad Gita, a revered Hindu scripture. He considered it a source of great inspiration. Swami Vivekananda, the teachings of Swami Vivekananda had a profound impact on Bose from a young age. Vivekananda's ideas about universalism, nationalism, social service, and reform resonated deeply with him. He was influenced by Vivekananda's emphasis on spiritual and social aspects of life. Hindu spirituality Hindu spirituality played an essential role in Bose's political and social thought. It was an integral part of his identity and worldview. While some of his contemporaries in the Indian political landscape leaned toward atheistic socialism and communism, Bose maintained a connection to inner religious explorations throughout his life. This set him apart from those who rejected religious and spiritual influences in their political ideology. Synthesis of Ideologies Bose's political ideology evolved over time. In a 1930 speech in Calcutta, he expressed his preference for a synthesis of what modern Europe calls socialism and fascism. He was critical of Jawaharlal Nehru's 1933 statement that there was no middle road between communism and fascism. Bose believed that communism's rejection of nationalism and religion made it an unlikely ideology to gain ground in India. Instead, he suggested that a synthesis between communism and fascism could take hold in the Indian context. In 1944, Bose reiterated his belief in a philosophy that should be a synthesis between national socialism and communism. This reflected his conviction that a unique blend of ideologies, distinct from Western models, was necessary for India's political and social transformation. Subhas Chandra Bose's ideological journey was marked by a commitment to India's independence, a deep connection to Hindu spirituality, and a search for a political path that would effectively serve the nation's interests. His ideological views have continued to be a subject of scholarly analysis and debate. Subhas Chandra Bose's stance on authoritarianism and his evolving political views during his life reflect the complexities of his ideological journey. Here's a breakdown of his thoughts on authoritarianism. Belief in authoritarianism. Bose believed that authoritarianism could play a crucial role in achieving the liberation and reconstruction of Indian society. He expressed admiration for the authoritarian methods he observed in Italy and Germany during the 1930s. He thought that these authoritarian approaches could be employed to build an independent India, suggesting that a strong central government with dictatorial powers might be necessary, at least for a certain period, to overcome India's challenges. Shift in Democratic Beliefs In the earlier phase of his political career, Bose had advocated for democracy as the best option for India. However, during the course of World War II, 
and possibly as early as the 1930s, Bose's views began to change. He came to believe that a democratic system might not be sufficient to address India's deep-rooted issues, such as poverty and social inequalities. He started to favor a socialist state, influenced by his observations of the Soviet-Russian model, which he admired. This socialist state was seen as necessary for the process of national rebuilding and transformation. Complex Political Stand Subhas Chandra Bose's alliance with the Axis powers during World War II is viewed through various lenses. Some argue that his collaboration was based on more than just pragmatism, emphasizing his militant nationalism. They highlight that Bose supported liberal ideas such as the empowerment of women and secularism. Others suggest that Bose might have been using populist mobilization methods common to many post-colonial leaders, and his association with Axis powers was a matter of expedience. In summary, Subhas Chandra Bose's political journey included a shift from an initial democratic ideal to a belief in authoritarianism as a means to achieve India's liberation and reconstruction. His evolving views and alliances during a critical period in India's struggle for independence continued to be a subject of debate and interpretation. Subhas Chandra Bose's stance on anti-Semitism is a complex and controversial aspect of his political career. Here's an overview of his positions and actions related to this issue. Opposition to Granting Jewish Refugees Asylum Prior to the outbreak of World War II, Bose was known to oppose granting asylum to Jewish refugees in India. This stance put him in conflict with other political groups, including the Indian National Congress. In December 1938, after the anti-Jewish pogrom known as the Night of Broken Glass, Prohindu Mahasabha journals published articles supporting German anti-Semitism. Bose was the only prominent figure within the Congress who opposed this position. In April 1939, Bose refused to support a party motion that would have allowed Jews to find refuge in India. Shift in views during wartime. In 1938, Bose had denounced Nazi racial policies and the persecution of Jews. However, by 1942, he had published an article in the journal On Riff, where he suggested that anti-Semitism should be a part of the Indian liberation movement. In this article, Bose made claims that Indians were true Aryans and brethren of the Germans. He also stated that the swastika, a symbol of Nazi Germany, was an ancient Indian symbol. Bose asserted that anti-Semitism should be part of the Indian struggle because he believed that Jews assisted the British in exploiting Indians. Lack of expressing concern for Holocaust victims. One of the most troubling aspects of Bose's association with Nazi Germany is that he left behind numerous documents and statements but did not express the slightest concern or sympathy for the millions who perished in Nazi concentration camps. Even when the horrific details of concentration camps like Auschwitz were revealed to the world upon their liberation, Bose did not react, nor did he express any indignation. Bose's shifting views on anti-Semitism, from an initial denunciation to later incorporation into his vision of Indian liberation, continued to be a subject of controversy and debate. His alliance with the Axis powers during World War II, despite the atrocities of the Nazi regime, raises ethical questions about his legacy and choices during that period. Quotes. One of Sabah's Chandra Bose's most famous quotes was, Give me blood and I will give you freedom. He also used the rallying cry Dili Chelo, meaning on to Delhi, to motivate the INA armies. Another slogan he coined was Ithad, Etimad, Kurbani, which translates to unity, agreement, sacrifice. Legacy. Subhas Chandra Bose's defiance of British authority in India made him a hero to many Indians, but his wartime alliances with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan have left a complicated legacy. His legacy is marked by issues of authoritarianism, anti-Semitism, and military failures. Memorials. Subhas Chandra Bose has been honored on postage stamps and coins in India, with various releases over the years. Several institutions, places, and transportation services in India bear his name, such as Nataji Subhas Chandra Bose International Airport in Kolkata and the Nataji Express train. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited the Nataji Bhawan in Kolkata and acknowledged Bose's role in the Indian independence movement. In 2021, the government of India declared January 23 as Parakram Divas to commemorate his birth anniversary. A holographic statue of Bose was installed at India Gate to mark his 125th birth anniversary. In popular media, Subhas Chandra Bose has been the subject of various films and books. Notable mentions include the 2004 film Nataji Subhas Chandra Bose, The Forgotten Hero, the 2017 web series Bose, Dead Slash Alive, 
and the 2019 Bengali film Gumnami, which deals with the mystery surrounding Bose's death. Books such as His Majesty's Opponent and a documentary titled Subhash Chandra Bose, the mystery explore aspects of his life and the controversies surrounding his death.